Hello, thank you all for joining us for our presentation on Vincent Russo's top five favorite trusts. My name is Ashley, and before we begin, let's cover a few housekeeping items. For starters, your lines are muted. You may type your questions into the Q&A box provided on the Zoom toolbar. Please note that we will answer your questions at the conclusion of the presentation. We are showing our webcams and PowerPoints. Please write in the chat box and let me know if you run into any technical issues along the way. I will be monitoring the chats throughout the session. We will share with all of you today's recording and PowerPoint. It will also be made available on our website. Finally, let us know how we did today by completing a brief survey that will appear on your screen when you leave the webinar. So let's get to know your speaker and our managing partner, Vincent J. Russo. He has earned his Master's of Law in Taxation, is a certified elder law attorney and member of the Council of Advanced Practitioners. Vincent is co-founder of the Academy of Special Needs Planners, founding member, fellow, and fifth president of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, and co-founder of the Teresa Alessandra Russo Foundation for Children with Special Needs. So we are now going to turn off our webcams and turn our attention to the slides and to Vincent. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, and it's great to be with everybody. Um, we're starting out a new year and uh, I thought it would be fun and interesting and hopefully helpful to all of you uh, for me to talk about the top five uh, trusts. Um, so this is uh, my list of the top five. So what we're gonna to cover today um, are the following. One, family protection trust. Two, Medicaid asset protection trust. Three, third party supplemental needs trust. Four, the irrevocable life insurance trust. And five, the spousal lifetime access trust. What I found, have found over the last uh, 20 plus years that more and more clients are interested in utilizing trusts as part of their estate plan, often to avoid probate, to make it easier for the family when assets pass on to them. And then there are these specialized trusts that can save uh, state taxes, minimize income taxes, provide asset protection, maximize government benefits. So there are lots of choices, a lot of tools in the toolkit uh, that we can pull out to help you. So let's go with number one, the Family Protection Trust. Lots of interest in this type of trust. This is a trust that allows you to protect your family members against bad things happening to them and to the money that you leave them. So in your estate plan, either through a will or a revocable living trust, you can say that upon my demise, I want my assets to go into a family protection trust for the benefit of my daughter, for the benefit of my son. And what that will do is protect those assets for them so that if your children have creditor problems or a bad marriage and there's a concern about a divorce or you have a family member and there's a concern that they could easily be influenced or might make a bad decision or be a spendthrift. We actually have a list of over 22 factors that would be of concern. You've worked so hard to have the assets you have and you're passing this legacy on to your family. Why pass it on outright subject to all of these potential problems? Why not have those assets go into a family protection trust, one for each beneficiary? Now, one of the concerns that you may have is that you don't want to tie your child's hands or that loved one that you're leaving in a protective way in the trust. So the child or the beneficiary can be a trustee or co-trustee of that trust so that they can be actively engaged in the managing of the assets 
and the distribution of those assets to them as and when they need them. But if they don't need those funds in a way that they would then be spending them, then why not have the trust hold the assets? So the trust can purchase a home, can, um, can in, invest in different stocks and bonds, have a brokerage account, all allowing the trust to protect the child or the beneficiary and those assets. Let's think about a bad marriage that you have a concern that your child may be in a divorce later on, or maybe isn't actually in a situation where there's a divorce uh, going on. Do you want to leave assets to your child outright and then make that part of a discussion in the divorce proceeding? Or if you leave assets to your child and they co-mingle those assets with a spouse who later seeks a divorce, now those assets are part of the marital pot. We can keep all of these assets out of that discussion completely through the Family Protection Trust. Uh, that's my number one choice. Let's go to number two, the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. This trust is for seniors and others who are concerned that with long-term care in the future they want to make sure that they don't lose all their assets before accessing Medicaid. Medicaid's the only government program that will pay for long-term care at home or in a nursing home. So the typical situation would be we meet with a couple and they're in their 60s and their main asset is a house. And they say, look, we want to protect this house but we also wanna maintain as much control over the house while we're alive. So we would recommend a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. And we would transfer the ownership of the house into that trust through, by using a deed. And they would name one of their family members, a child, let's say, to be the trustee. That trust would say that you, the person who set up the trust, have the right to live in the house the rest of your life, you're going to have to pay the real estate taxes and the bills. It's your house. And you have the ability to sell that house during your lifetime through the trust. So that if you decided to downsize or move, no problem. The trustee sells the house and buys another house for you. No one can throw you out of the house. And you keep your real estate uh, deductions, uh, you know, in terms of real property taxes. So the uh, seniors, um, real property tax exemption. So this is a terrific vehicle to put assets in a trust, knowing that you're not going to have to worry about losing them if you have the wrong illness and need long-term care. The wrong illness would be Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS. These are long-term care diseases and the system Medicare does not cover long-term care, only Medicaid, and there are strict eligibility rules. Now, why am I doing this in advance? You're doing it in advance because Medicaid says that when you apply for nursing home care, for example, they look back five years to see what you've done with your assets and they'll hold it against you if you transferred them out of your name. So this trust is used in advanced planning where you wanna take your assets, your residence, perhaps some of your liquid assets, put it in this Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. That starts the triggers, the look back period of the five years. So that when five years later, if and thereafter, if you needed that care, the assets in the trust will not be considered. They will not be held against you for purposes of qualifying for that Medicaid nursing home care. So nursing homes are a last resort. So perhaps it's Medicaid home care. And right now on the books, not yet implemented, is a very harsh rule for Medicaid home care that will be coming in that says, we're going to look back two and a half years to see what you did with your assets. And we're going to penalize you 
you made any transfers within two and a half years of filing that application. It's not the law yet, but it's on the books to be implemented. So the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust for seniors, people are concerned about uh, paying for long-term care in the future. You could go out and buy a long-term care insurance policy, or you can do additional Medicaid planning through the use of a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, or perhaps do a combination of the two. Very important trust, especially for seniors. So I've covered it here, and I'm just going to summarize it one more time because of the importance of it, that this trust is to protect your assets. If you need long-term care, you can put your house in it. You can put your uh, bank account funds, brokerage accounts, and allow you to qualify for home care or nursing home care once you get past the five years. The solution is the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. As I also stated, you can um, keep control over the trust. So if there's um, any income being generated, it can be set up so you can get the income from it. Your house will be protected and your assets will pass on to your heirs, avoiding probate. And you could sell the house and still qualify for the capital gain exclusion. So these are all benefits of the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Let's move on to number three, the Supplemental Needs Trust. This is a very important trust for parents who have a child, be a minor or an adult child with special needs. Or you may have a parent or another loved one that you would want to help in their, during their lifetime by utilizing your assets. So this type of trust, the supplemental needs trust, can be utilized in a way where the assets and income can benefit the person who has special needs or is disabled on government benefits without adversely impacting their eligibility for those benefits. Those benefits could be Medicaid or it could be supplemental security income under the Social Security program. Often this comes into play for parents who have a child with special needs. So the parent wants to have an estate plan where they'll leave their assets for the benefit of that child. But they can't put the assets directly in the child's name or else they're gonna lose their government benefits. So they put it into a supplemental needs trust. The trust will have a trustee. You can name another family member a professional to step in and be that trustee to manage the assets and the income and then use those monies for the benefit of the child as and when the child needs help. Making sure that they're doing it in a way, in a way not to adversely impact their eligibility for government benefits. So the typical situation I have a child who has autism, CP, um, some developmental disability. They're not able to manage their own affairs. I meet with the parents. The parents say, look, if something happens to us, we want these assets to be used for that child's benefit. And, and so we set up this trust. Now, it can be a revocable trust or an irrevocable trust when it's set up. Typically it's revocable, so the parents have total control over it. And they can fund it with some money during their lifetime or just $10 and then have the rest of their assets pass into that trust under their will. And now that trust is funded for the ongoing benefit of the child. It can be irrevocable, and often we're doing that if the parents are also doing estate tax planning. So if they have a larger estate in the area of over $5 million, then making it irrevocable could be advantageous to them. And that trust can be funded with any and all types of assets, the house, liquid assets, life insurance proceeds, 
and the income coming out of retirement accounts. So this is the number one document we use when we meet with parents who have a child with special needs. Let's move on to number four. This is the Irrevocable Life Insurance Trust. Now this trust is being used to protect your life insurance proceeds that'll get paid out on your demise. Now, most people understand that when they buy life insurance, that when that life insurance gets paid out, it is not subject to income tax. But if you own the policy in your own name and you're the insured, it's part of your estate. Being part of your estate means that it is subject to the estate tax rules. So someone could have a two or $3 million policy and when that policy pays out, it's valued at two or $3 million. And now they didn't have a taxable estate. Now they have a taxable estate. And New York kicks in and says, we're gonna take their maximum rate is 16%. The IRS kicks in when you are over roughly $11 million. And then you're at 40% plus the New York tax. So, why would you want to risk having your proceeds subject to estate taxes? There's a better way to do it. The other point is that this is a pot of liquid money and you've bought the insurance for a purpose. It might be to take care of a uh, surviving spouse or a child with special needs or for your children. So you would wanna do this in the most protective way possible. So we can build in protections like that family protection trust in the irrevocable life insurance trust. So life insurance can be income and estate tax free. That's what you want, you want it to be both. So how do we do this? We take the insurance policy and we make a gift of the policy, the ownership to a trust. It's an irrevocable life insurance trust. So now the trustee you name, who can be a family member, will be the owner of that policy. When that policy pays out, the proceeds will go into the trust. Once you do this and three years go by, it's no longer part of your estate for estate tax purposes. So there is a clawback rule, it's a three-year rule. So you can't do this uh, on your deathbed. You have to do it in advance. So let's take an example of a life insurance policy worth $5 million. And I transfer it to an irrevocable life insurance trust. And let's say you have a taxable estate, both federal and New York. And so it's gonna be in the range of 45%. So 45% of, of $5 million is gonna to go to the government as an estate tax. So by doing this, someone with a $5 million policy saves $2,250,000 for their family. You want every dollar of that life insurance policy to be for your family. You don't want the government putting their hands in your pocket. And you can draft provisions in this trust similar to the family protection trust if you want, and you can further protect your children or your beneficiaries from any potential problems that they may have or run into during their lifetime. And now the last of uh, the, my top five, the spousal lifetime access trust sometimes referred to as a slat. And this is where you have an estate that's either taxable or you're concerned that you've done okay and you have you know, several million dollars of assets and you're in your 50s and you don't have a taxable estate today, but it can well grow in the future and become taxable. Also, we don't know with the new administration whether we're gonna see significant 
estate tax law changes. And it is likely there will be changes. And it may be that the exemption that we currently have the new, uh, at the federal level, over $11 million right now, could drop dramatically down to 7 million, 5 million, 3.5 million. So we're going to need to watch that. And um, it's important for you uh, to make sure that you're reviewing your estate plan on an annual basis to take into account that laws change, especially in the area of the tax laws. So the Spousal Lifetime Access Trust works in a way to freeze the value of what you have today so that the future appreciation will not end up being subject to estate tax. I had a client just recently where they have an asset that they believe is worth $500,000 today, but because of certain uh, events that are likely to occur in the near future, that 500,000 is going to turn into over $3 million. So we would best be served by locking in the $500,000 value in that person's estate, rather than having the three plus million subject to estate tax. But most people say, look, I can't give away my assets because I need the income from those assets to live on, especially those who are in their retirement years. And this is where the Spousal Lifetime Access Trust can work in such a beautiful way because this trust allows your spouse to receive the income stream from that asset during your lifetime. So if I set up a trust for my wife, I uh, and it's a slat, she can be the beneficiary during her lifetime of that income. She could even get the assets back. That would work against the tax planning, but if you needed access, the trust allows it. So that this trust freezes the value, maintains ongoing access to those assets through your spouse. A very effective estate uh, tax planning tool. So those were my top five. Now, I thought I'd throw a bonus in here. The bonus trust, the asset protection trust, can't be done when someone's in crisis, but if they have a serious concern about potential liability, uh, so often speaking with doctors, they may be concerned about potential liability or wealthier clients because of the size of their estate. So the questions are, how can I protect my assets if I fall into debt? How can I protect my house, my other liquid assets, my retirement accounts? So the solution can be what's called an asset protection trust. We don't do this lightly. We make sure there's a really a strong reason to do it. There are fees involved uh, that can get uh, more expensive, but for someone who needs this benefit of protecting their assets, from a potential claim, the Asset Protection Trust can be the solution. So before I get to uh, questions that you may have, um, we uh, will just do a quick run through of the five. We had the Family Protection Trust, excellent trust. When you're gonna leave assets to loved ones, leave it in the most protective way. We had the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. That's the trust that protects assets, especially for seniors who are concerned about needing long-term care in the future. Those costs can be so high. A nursing home can cost over $150,000 a year on Long Island. And home care can run over $75,000 a year. So that's a very important trust. The third, Supplemental Needs Trust. So the Supplemental Needs Trust is where you have someone with special needs, someone with a disability, and you wanna leave assets for them, you wanna protect them, and you don't wanna adversely impact their eligibility for government benefits. Then on the tax planning side, we talked about the Irrevocable Life Insurance Trust, 
make sure your life insurance is income and estate tax free. And we talked about the spousal lifetime access trust to make sure that you in larger estates or assets that you believe are gonna grow significantly, we freeze the value of that asset in your estate for estate tax purposes while maintaining access to the income and assets that you put in that trust for the benefit of your spouse. So that's my top five. I hope this has been helpful to you. And let's see if we have any questions. Ashley? We do, Vincent. Uh, it's in the chat window. If you're okay. able to pull that up from Dina. If not, I'll read it out loud. Yeah, let's see. The chat window. Yes, I found the chat. All right. So let's uh, go to the top. All right. And I know we're going to talk about a couple of things there. So Dina, Flo, I was curious if there are any limitations to what the money for a supplemental needs trust can be paid for. I have a sibling who has special needs who's going to be receiving a large settlement. Yes, the answer is yes, we're gonna to need to be careful. Now, in a supplemental needs trust, especially if there's a large settlement coming into that trust, uh, we wanna make sure that we never take the assets and put them directly, uh, in your case, in, this, in your sibling's name, because that will have an impact on the benefits that he may be receiving. Now we can use it for his benefit, we can pay for different items for his benefit. If it's Medicaid, we can pay for anything that will enhance his life, pay his living expenses. There really is no limitation in terms of Medicaid. We can pay for experimental medical uh, services or care or treatment that Medicaid doesn't cover. If he's on SSI, now we need to be careful. So if we pay for food or shelter, it can reduce his SSI check by one third. So uh, we would try to avoid doing that, but if we needed to spend those monies on health, on, on shelter and, and, and food, shelter and food, then we have to understand there may be this one third reduction. There are also some options and doing it in a certain way so that you don't have the reduction, but that's on a case-by-case -case basis. So hopefully that's uh, helpful to you. Good, very good question. Carol, can a family protection trust protect a son who has a large judgment against them? Yes, we're talking about your assets, not his assets. So in that situation, if your son has a large judgment against them, you can set up your estate plan to leave assets in a family protection trust for his benefit and the monies can be used for his needs and take care of them. And the creditor, the creditor who has a claim uh, against your son and his assets cannot get to those assets that you place in the family protection trust. Very good question. Yes, this is where it can be extremely helpful. Ashley, I think those were our two questions today. On the chat, uh, we have several that have come in through the Q&A box. All right. You are a popular man. Well, <laughs> these are engaging uh, yes, they uh, are. concepts mm -hmm. uh, that really can help people. Uh, Kathleen asks, tax implications concerning house and brokerage in an asset trust. All right. So I'm not sure which of the trusts we're talking about. So if it's a um, family protection trust, um, well, let's, let's just say when you put assets, let me do it in a general way. If you put assets in a trust and that trust has income generated from those assets, then that trust has to file as a general rule an income tax return. Now, who pays the tax on the income? will depend on what's done with the income during that tax year. So putting aside revocable trust where the person who sets it up always pays the income tax, when we set up a family protection trust, 
we set up, um, you know, under, you know, that you fund after you pass away. We set up a, um, a slat. Uh, we set up an eyelid. These are trusts where the income earned in that trust, the trustee will have to file a tax return and the trust pays tax on that income unless the income was used for the beneficiary. If it's used for the beneficiary, the beneficiary has to report it. All right, this gets complicated. So there are some trusts irrevocable where what I just laid out is what happens. But there is another way, a technique where you can take any of those trusts while you're alive and if you fund them and you can set it up so that you, the person who sets it up will pay the income tax on the income in that trust. And why that could be helpful is that the tax rates in a trust are higher generally. Uh, you get through the brackets more quickly than if it's on your personal income tax return. So there are tax implications of funding these trusts. We can set it up in a way that during your lifetime, if you're setting it up, you'll just keep reporting all the income on your return, or it can be set up or after you pass away in a way that then the trust will have to file a tax return and or the children or the beneficiary will have to pick up the income if that income is paid out for them, for their benefit. So I'm sorry, it's complicated. Uh, we could do a whole nother presentation just on the taxation of trusts. Ashley, take note, because let's do that. Uh, that way I have 30 minutes to explain this in a way that people can really understand. All right. We have an anonymous attendee who's asked, did you not mention the living trust, which becomes a marital trust and bypass trust on the death of the grantor? Are these no longer a good idea? Actually, I had that on my list and went back and forth whether to put that um, in the top five. And um, I waver on it. Uh, I think this is uh, more useful than let's say uh, were more relevant than the spousal lifetime access trust. And, but I went with the spousal lifetime access trust because most people haven't heard about it. So this type of trust is very helpful. And anyone who's married with uh, a, a taxable estate in New York or, or a taxable estate at the federal level, you would really want to have a trust that uh, leaves assets in a way to avoid or minimize the estate taxes through the use of what's called a marital trust and a bypass trust. Uh, I did a lecture on this, um, uh, Ashley, last year. We, we, I did a lecture on uh, planning for married couples, uh, estate tax planning for married couples. So if you give us your email address, uh, we're more than happy to send you information on that presentation that'll go into more detail. So anyone who wants uh, to uh, check out that presentation, uh, send us an email through the chat. Uh, Ashley, also, can they get to it through the uh, website? You sure can. You can view all of our uh, webinar recordings on the website. Uh, so I can send a chat um, with that link right now for you guys. Great. Yep. Um, David asks, if you have a, a long-term care policy, is the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust necessary? Uh, so on a case-by-case -case basis, we, we would analyze that. Uh, it may be that you don't need a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust because you have sufficient long-term care insurance. The big question is, what is sufficient? So we would see, do you have a lifetime policy? or is your policy only for three years or five years? If it's a shorter term, then a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust is probably still a good idea. There's another type of long-term care policy which is called the partnership policy. And if you have the partnership policy in New York, then you don't need a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. So we look at each case, look at your situation, um, we talk about you know, your health, the coverage under your policy, the type of assets you have, 
and then we make a recommendation whether it's a good idea or not to have a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. The way we do that is we have a planning meeting. We give you a questionnaire in advance. Uh, we ask for financial and personal information, certain legal documents. We then meet with you in person or virtually through Zoom or by phone. We uh, listen to your concerns. We create a plan for you. Uh, and if anyone's interested in that type of meeting, uh, you can get to us through the chat uh, uh, or the Q&A, or simply call our office and ask for Ashley. Ashley is our client service coordinator, and she can answer any questions you have about the meeting, the fees, what would be involved, uh, and we go from there. Kathleen uh, also asked, would a life insurance trust be better than a brokerage account as far as taxes within an asset trust? Would life insurance trust be better than a brokerage account as far as at taxes within an asset trust? All right, so I'm not sure uh, the, the question on this. Um, so, um, if it's a family, if it's the asset trust is the family protection trust, then I think um, you would want to keep your life insurance trust separate um, and use the, the strategy of the irrevocable life insurance trust. If, you, if, if that's not what you intended in your question, um, just give Ashley a call and we'll understand what your question is and then we can get back to you. In a, in a more detailed way. Um, David asks, if a spouse is on SSD for compassionate care, does this qualify for supplemental needs trust? Well, when someone's on SSD or what's called SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance, then there are, there are no eligibility rules uh, that come into play. So we don't have to worry about that individual having assets directly in their name. But there may be an issue about how those assets get managed and making sure that someone's there to manage it properly. And we don't know if that person may need additional uh, care in the future and perhaps Medicaid. So a supplemental needs trust may still make sense in that situation. Here again, we would evaluate the facts uh, and your concerns and your objectives and then make a, a recommendation. Uh, Glenn asks, my uh, mom owns her home and is not living in her home anymore. She is now living with my sister with a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Would it be best to place the house in the trust or sell the home and put the proceeds in the trust? Well, I guess you've, you've hit the most important question up front on a practical side. Um, do you intend to sell the house? If you intend to sell the house and you have it up for sale, then uh, I think you could put the house uh, up for sale, go into contract, uh, close on it, and then take the money and do further planning with the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Sometimes we refer to it as a map. If you think it could take a while to get the house sold and you wanna get the clock ticking as quickly as possible, then you should set up the, the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust now and put the deed in and then, uh, and, and that starts the clock on the five year rule or potentially the 30 month rule for home care and then have your trustee sell the house. The tax consequences will be the same. It'll be reported on your mom's income tax return. She'll be entitled to the capital gain exclusion. Rosemary, I have a question regarding a SNID, Supplemental Needs Trust. My son is handicapped and currently has a trust with YAI, I have no control over the trust and, to ha and have to request for anything needed. Is there a way to transfer to another trust where maybe a family member is in charge? I also have to pay $550 spend down because my son receives social security benefits from his dad who is deceased and not disability benefits. Is there any way to lower that spend down? So the trust you have with the YAI may be what's called a pool trust. And, and so uh, I'm not sure, I'd have to actually know for sure what type of trust you're referring to, uh, but if it's a pool trust, 
then um, they have control over it. And um, we'd have to understand whether you are able for, uh, under those that trust would be a what's called a master trust would allow you to place it out into another trust. Uh, so number one, we'd, we'd have to look at that. And number two, depending on the type of benefits he's on, we'd have to understand whether that would disrupt his benefits for any uh, limited period of time. So, it, you know, without, I'd have to understand the whole backdrop to your situation to really uh, opine here. Uh, but I would say that um, it's likely in that trust and you're going to have to just work with that trust or uh, it could be transferred into another pool trust. Um, and perhaps that would they would be uh, friendlier or more helpful to you if you're feeling uh, that concern. On the spend down of your son's social security benefits, um, uh, and it's based on your dad's record, not his disability, uh, as to lowering the spend down, we here again, we'd have to have more information about what uh, monies are being used uh, and what are they being used for to figure out if there is a way to reduce uh, the spend down or to lower it. Um, okay, Jennifer asked, what's the difference between a third party trust and a revocable trust? Um, a third party trust means that you're putting assets in it to benefit someone else. So a third party trust can be revocable, which means you could set it up, change it anytime you want, control it, but it's set up to benefit someone else or it can be irrevocable. So, um, so the type of trust is third party, um, meaning what it's being used for. And then every trust can either, we have to ask the question, is it revocable or irrevocable? In third party trust, it can be either, depending on the situation. Um, would an irrevocable trust, can, can it be left for more than one beneficiary? Absolutely. You can name as many beneficiaries as you like. Uh, Glenn asks, she presently has a transfer on debt deed with me and my two siblings as the beneficiary. I think that might've been going back up to the question, was that the question about the uh, tr Medicaid Asset Protection Trust? I just wanna see real quick. Um, Vincent, if you click on the dismissed tab, under the Q and A's, uh, you oh, can okay. review all the old questions. Thanks. I've been trying to archive them. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. So, so that that has to do with the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. And let me go back to where where was I here um, on the list of questions. Um, she presently has a transfer on debt deed with me and my two siblings as the beneficiary. All right. So there's there's um, really got to see the deed uh, to see exactly how it's worded. I don't know if she retained the life estate and named you as the residuary beneficiaries. And if so, then we got to be really careful what we're doing at this point. Um, uh, so if that's the nature of the deed, um, I think that requires really a meeting to uh, sort out and explain the different consequences of what's been done and what changes you could make and what the benefits would be of that. All right, I have a 93 year old mother whose husband has recently been transferred to a, um, a uh, nursing facility. Um, they have separate accounts, savings accounts and only a home together. Is there a way to protect their assets and have Medicaid pay in spite of the five year look back? Y uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, call right after this meeting because uh, you can set up, uh, you, we can put a plan in place where the assets can be in your mother's name and your father or your father or husband, her husband can uh, file for Medicaid. All right. The key is though, we got it. The assets have to be moved out of his name into her name. And uh, depending on if this is a second marriage, there may be some issues there, maybe not. Uh, the key though right now is to make sure uh, we understand what the facts are and then we can structure a plan. But 
uh, the likelihood is that we could be extremely helpful in getting Medicaid, even though there's the five-year look back period. Nancy, can I open an irrevocable supplemental need trust for my 60 year old brother who's very low income and is not good at managing money? Absolutely. Uh, that would be a trust you could set up and, and you could either make it revocable or irrevocable. We'd have to talk about the pros and cons of that. Uh, and then those assets can be there to protect your brother on an ongoing basis. Jennifer, what is the difference between a third party trust and a revocable trust? I think we covered that one. Um, does the supplemental need to be established while the does the supplemental needs trust need to be established while the parent is alive, or can the SNP be established after the death of the parent from the proceeds of a will for the benefit of a child? Yes, you can do it either way. You can set it up while you're alive, and you can either fund it or fund it with ten dollars, and then your will can say or your revocable living trust that when I pass. I'll fund that trust so you know it's already there in existence. Or you don't set it up now. You actually write into your will document or your revocable living trust document that you want a trust set up um, when you pass away under that document and fund it through your assets. So it can be done either way. Here are some pros and cons to it. Kathleen, I meant would it be better if I bought a life insurance policy and put that? in the trust instead of our brokerage account? So, so that's a very good question, Kathleen, as to um, the benefits of having life insurance and would it pay to uh, have a life insurance policy uh, and use some of your money now to pay the premiums? So it'll go to your health based on your age, size of your assets, your overall planning objectives. So once we have a handle on that, then we could tell you which would be the better path to take. And I'll just share with you, I have um, five, um, part, uh, four partners, four partners and uh, a highly experienced associate that does all the planning in our office. And, uh, and I weigh in when I need to, uh, but they are excellent at doing this planning meeting up front, figuring out what you need, don't need. I, want you, I don't want you spending money setting up trust that you don't need. Um, I want you to make sure you get value out of any plan you put in place. Anonymous, can the family trust resulting from the death of owner of a living trust be constructed so the trustee can pay income to either the spouse or to the other named individuals at trustee's discretion? Can the family trust, the family protection trust um, from the death of owner of the living trust be constructed? So the answer is yes, that you can have this uh, family protection trust um, that's funded on the death and constructed in a way to pay either the income either to the spouse or to other named individuals at the trustee's discretion. Kevin, does a trust need to be funded? Can it just be a document? Depends on what state you're in, but, um, and because I don't want to give an answer for other states, I, you know, I'm licensed in New York and Florida. We have a lot of snowbird clients. Um, so in New York, you have to fund it with an asset. And that asset can be what's called a seed asset, which means it could be just $10. But something needs to be put in the trust when you sign it in order to make that trust a, a valid document or a valid trust, I should say, in New York. And then lastly, uh, can Medicaid access your IRAs to pay for long-term care? How do you protect the IRAs? The good news here is that I, there are some protective rules with IRAs under the Medicaid rules. So depending on whether that IRA is in what's called permanent pay status, it's an income stream, not an asset. So it won't adversely impact the asset test. It'll have some impact on the income budgeting. Um, there are some options there we could consider, uh, but most clients um, who are in a crisis and need to access Medicaid, um, they'll just keep the IRA and keep it in um, payout status and not have it count as an asset for Medicaid. A couple of quick questions just came in. You'll give me a heads up in five minutes, uh, Ashley. 
uh, will wrap up. Um, so we won't go beyond an hour. Uh, Kevin, if a trust holds assets and the assets don't gain any income, does anyone need to pay taxes on it? Uh, no, if the, if the assets are in a trust and it's not generating taxable income, uh, then you don't have to worry about it. And my good friend, Corinne, uh, Corinne is a longtime client. Uh, sorry to you have a friend. I'm sorry to hear you have a friend whose husband has a terminal illness, approximately six months to live, both in their late 50s. Ah, it's terrible. And do not qualify for Medicare. They own a home. Wife is concerned she'll not be able to afford the home care for six months. Is there a way the husband can qualify for Medicaid? The answer is yes, they can qualify for Medicaid, um, assuming they're in New York. Uh, and we're talking about the New York Medicaid Home Care Pro uh, Program. There is a, pro a program inside that program called uh, Immediate uh, Need. Um, my only concern is how quickly uh, this all can be put in place. Uh, and it may be that it, you know, we can get real fortunate and have less than 30 days, or it could be a few months to get it in place. Um, so a decision would have to be made, is it worth um, trying to do all that right now? We'd have to assess it further. Um, lastly, once in an open and irrevocable supplement, such as for my adult brother, can he still qualify for social services as moderate income housing? And the answer is yes, but we need to uh, counsel the trustee on how they utilize the funds. Uh, but the answer as a general answer would be yes. So uh, thank you for, I mean, we've never had a webinar with so many questions. And so uh, Ashley, let's uh, kind of uh, wrap things up. Sure, Vincent, I'll go ahead and turn on uh, my webcam. Um, if you wanna skip to the next slide, awesome. Yeah. Uh, let me just cover a few things on here. Uh, who are we? What makes Russo Law Group different? Uh, well, for starters, Vincent Russo does, uh, but we have uh, 35 years of experience, even more so over 150 years of combined professional experience focusing on elder law and estate planning. We've served over 17,000 families, and I think that number might be 18,000 now, uh, but in any event, uh, in New York City and uh, on Long Island. We are a large firm consisting of five partners and four associates, and we are ranked as a best law firm by the US News. And finally, make sure that you're subscribed to our blog. We share recent published articles and other educational resources, plus news and events happening at the firm. And speaking of, I know Vincent and I just wanna to touch on two of those. Uh, I'll go ahead and start. Um, Vincent will be appearing on the Catholic Faith Network's CFN Live on March 2nd at 9 a.m. to discuss the importance of long-term care planning, Medicaid coverage in New York, and how Medicaid home care services can help you. So be sure to turn, tune in uh, to the CFN Network on March 2nd at 9 a.m. Okay, Ashley, thank you so much. And I just wanna do a, uh, a shout out to the Teresa Foundation which supports children with special needs. It was established in memory of my daughter. And we have a virtual comedy night. So everybody has been at home for so long being safe and why not have some fun? It'll be March 12th, Friday at 8 p.m. It's one hour, it'll be virtual. Uh, and um, we're gonna have Derek Tennant who's a wonderful inspirational speaker and comedian on and if you uh, are interested, you can just let us know through the chat uh, or the Q&A, or you can go to the website, Teresa with an H, TeresaFoundation.org. And um, right on the homepage, you can click in. And if you register today, we'll send you popcorn. Uh, <laughs> so for the virtual comedy night. Uh, so uh, please take uh, advantage of that. <laughs> uh, so we'd love to have you. Um, of course, we're available to help you with your estate planning needs. And as I mentioned, Ashley's my go-to person. Thank you, Ashley. Thanks. 
Thanks, Vincent. Yep, if uh, you guys need us uh, to help with your estate plan, please contact us for a planning meeting. I know we've got the number uh, on the screen. It's 800-680-1717. Uh, our attorneys are happy to meet with you, address your concerns, review your legal documents, and lay out an action plan uh, designed specifically to help you. Also, please recommend us to your friends and family. Yeah, and we'll be doing another webinar. We'll, we'll, you know, within the next month, and we'll let you know. Or just go to our website at bjrusolaw.com, uh, or call Ashley, and she'd love to hear from you. And uh, we'll let you know when the next webinar is going to be. We'll keep you all so, in the loop. <laughs> right. So everybody have a great day, and uh, thanks for joining us. Bye.